When it comes to dysphagia, do thicker liquids actually mean your patient will be safer? And is aspirated thickener really that bad? Can't we just put a patient on thickener from bedside swallow assessments alone, at least until we can actually get the patient set up for an instrumental swallow study? Today, we're going to deep dive into the research on this topic. Join me as I discuss the purpose of thickener, what the research shows, and the clinical implications of this research. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. Number one, what's the purpose of thickener? Thin liquids are the easiest thing to aspirate because of how quickly it can spill or propel into the pharynx and how much more difficult it is to control when compared to solids or thicker liquids. How many times have you accidentally inhaled some water or had part of a drink go down the wrong way and you start suddenly coughing your head off? Even folks who don't have dysphagia aspirate on thin liquids from time to time or even their own saliva. So the idea of thickened liquids is that these liquids are easier to control and move more slowly thus reducing risk of aspiration. If you toss water onto a wall, then toss some nectar or honey thick liquids onto a wall, you can clearly see the differences in speed as the liquids drip down the wall. Early research from 1990 looked at the effects of bolus viscosity or thickness on quantitative features of the oral and pharyngeal phases of swallowing. This study by Dantas and colleagues specifically found that thickened liquids primarily delayed oral and pharyngeal bolus transit increased the duration of pharyngeal peristaltic waves, and prolonged UES opening. This was all observed under concurrent video fluoroscopic and manometric studies on 10 individuals who participated in the study. Unfortunately, the development and increased use of thickened liquids for patients with dysphagia has led to a lot of cases where other medical staff and many SLPs rely on thickener even at bedside. Many SLPs, including myself, have recommended thickened liquids at bedside at one point or another whenever we've seen a patient cough with thins, but sound great with thick liquids, even without an instrumental swallow study to see what's actually happening. As more evidence emerges about thickener and its effects on the respiratory system, however, we're beginning to see that thickened liquids aren't as benign as we once thought. We're now starting to learn that thickeners should not be prescribed without an instrumental swallow assessment first. I can personally admit that I've thickened liquids at bedside before. I don't mean to bring up this hot button topic to make you or anyone feel inferior. This is just part of that uncomfortable process of growth. I can think of plenty of times where I heard a patient clear their cough, clear their throat, or speak with a semi-white vocal quality after taking sips of thin liquid and my knee-jerk response was to immediately test thicker liquids. If there was no cough, throat clear, or wet sounds, then it felt pretty good to say, okay, they're safe on thick liquids and recommend it without a second thought. I've also worked with plenty of colleagues who practice the same and I completely get why this happens and happens often. It's how most of us have been taught and not all of us have access to instrumental swallow studies. That's why I'm going to talk about the research behind aspiration of thickener and pulmonary implications next both so we can see what the evidence shows and potentially give you something to bring to your administrators if they push back on instrumental swallow studies often. Number two, let's see what the research says. Let's keep talking about my own personal example of hearing a patient cough with thin liquids, but not thick, and recommending thick and liquids on that observation alone. Does a cough always mean aspiration? Nope. And on the flip side, an absence cough does not mean the absence of aspiration. This was actually studied in 2018 by Miles and colleagues, where they looked at how patients responded to aspirating different consistencies. Miles and colleagues found that patients may be more likely to silently aspirate thickened liquids than thin liquids. Wait, what? Hang on, let me repeat that. Patients might be more likely to silently aspirate thickened liquids than thin liquids. The study also observed patients who aspirated thickened liquids, but did not aspirate thin liquids. To quote this article, this has important implications for clinical practice and debunks the idea that thick fluids are universally safer than thin fluids. How could this be? Why would a patient cough with thins when aspirated, but not cough when they aspirate thickened liquids? This question is tough to answer, and not all researchers agree on the mechanism behind this. According to Miles and colleagues, one possibility is that fast-moving thin liquids could penetrate deeper and trigger a subglottic cough response. Also, the volume of aspirated material could also impact cough response. So if a larger volume of thin liquid is aspirated, which could be more likely with thin liquids, then this could lead to a greater stimulation and higher likelihood of coughing. So to recap, 
Just because a patient coughs with thin liquids and does not cough with thickened liquids does not mean that they are not aspirating. This is incredibly important knowledge to have when advocating for instrumental swallow studies. Now let's see what the research says about the pulmonary effects of aspirated thickener. There were several animal-based research publications that point to harmful and potentially fatal changes in the lungs as a result of aspirated thickened liquids. Studies have found that aspiration of cornstarch thickener led to significantly increased alveolar hemorrhaging as compared to water and xanthan gum aspirators. Xanthan gum aspiration led to increased pulmonary interstitial congestion, pulmonary edema, and significantly increased heterophilic inflammation as compared to water and cornstarch aspiration. Along with inducing pulmonary inflammation, Ari and colleagues found that aspiration of thickened liquids can prolong the duration of lung injury in mice. Obviously, we can't recreate these exact conditions with humans, but we can still apply this knowledge to our cl clinical practice. Want another research article that looks at thickened liquids and aspiration pneumonia? Okay. O'Keefe reported in 2018 article that thickened liquids have no sound evidence behind the idea that it reduces the risk of pneumonia in patients with dysphagia. Patients are actually more likely to reduce their fluid intake when they are recommended thickened liquids. It makes sense. Thickened liquids aren't really desirable to drink or even all that thirst quenching. Have you ever tried thickened liquids? The reduced fluid intake increases their risk of dehydration along with increased risk of UTI, electrolyte imbalance, constipation, fecal impaction, cognitive impairment, functional decline, and even death. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't want to miss, to make, so make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Do you have any specific questions about aspiration and thickened liquids? Leave a comment below and tell me about it. We'll be sure to get your questions answered as soon as possible. Make sure to stick around till the end to claim a freebie or two. Number three, now let's move into clinical implications and evidence. What can SLPs actually do with this information? So let's recap what we know from research. Thank you, Miles and colleagues from their 2018 paper. We know that just because a patient coughs with thins and doesn't cough with thickened liquids, it does not mean they're not aspirating thickened liquids. We know that the risk of silent aspiration is actually higher with thickened liquids than it is with thin liquids. Thanks to Arian colleagues, as well as Native Zeltzer and colleagues, we know the potential negative impacts of thickener on the pulmonary system and how they can be surprisingly worse than the effects of aspirated thin liquids. This is helpful information that can be used to guide your practice and support your advocacy efforts. Along with the pulmonary risk, we should keep in mind that SLPs have been found to misdiagnose dysphagia up to 70% of the time at the bedside, as found in a 2002 paper by Leder and Espinosa. All of this means if we thicken liquids at the bedside, we are putting patients at risk for dehydration and other serious diagnoses for potentially no reason at all. Okay, so what? Well, this information shows us that SLPs should reconsider the use of thickened liquid trials as part of our bedside swallow examinations. I 100% know and understand that this can be a controversial topic, but it's always healthy to discuss this topic because it's how our field evolves. Because the truth is that without access to an instrumental swallow assessment, we can't confirm how safe thickened liquids truly are. But what do you do if you don't have access to instrumentation? Fortunately, there are times when we are unable to complete an instrumental quickly or determine if one is indicated, maybe pending goals of care or candidacy. This is where it is essential to understand the risks and benefits of each potential choice. This is where it's important to start advocating. Take time to create in-services, cite this literature in your documentation, strike up discussions with nurses, doctors, dietitians, anyone who listen. If you can't access an instrumental swallow study, you can at least consider the list of predictors of aspiration as Laymore and colleagues pointed out. The predictors of aspiration pneumonia in order of highest risk include suctioning needs, COPD, CHF, feeding tube, bedridden, high case mix index, delirium, weight loss, dysphagia, and UTI. Remember, those are predictors of aspiration, but we also have the pillars of aspiration pneumonia as outlined by Dr. Ashford which shows that the presence of aspiration, a compromised immune system, and poor oral health all contribute to the development of aspiration pneumonia. Combine all of this information, we can determine the risks associated with each potential option. I have another video you can watch to dig even deeper on how to advocate for video fluoroscopy or fees titled How to Advocate for Instrumentals, if this is a relevant topic for you right now. I'm going to share a couple of scenarios regarding aspiration pneumonia development and thickened liquids. So many of us have found ourselves asking, why do some patients get aspiration pneumonia and others don't? 
Let's look at these two scenarios. Patient one is a 75 year old male who is deconditioned, bed bound with a diagnosis of COPD. He has a weak cough function. He has several cavities and decaying teeth. Patient two is a 75 year old male who has a history of tonsillar cancer and radiation 20 years ago. He is a dentalist and completes oral care three times a day. He is independently ambulatory and otherwise in good health. He has had a history of aspiration pneumonia around six years ago when he had the surgery and was in the hospital. Who's more likely to develop aspiration pneumonia? Patient number one is more likely to get aspiration pneumonia given his risk factors as outlined by Langmore, including deconditioning, bed bound, weak cough, and poor oral care. Let's give you another scenario. What would you do in this situation? Your patient is a 67 year old female who had an acute right hemisphere stroke. You are working on a Saturday at the hospital and are unable to access a video fluoroscopy until Monday. Your patient has left cranial nerve 7 and 12 impairments and also mild dysphonia with a possible cranial nerve 10 impairment. She demonstrates overt signs and symptoms of aspiration with all thin liquids trials and throat clearing with mildly thick liquids and with puree. So possibly signs and symptoms of aspiration. This patient also failed the three ounce water challenge. She is currently in the ICU, bed bound and dependent for all care. What are her risks for aspiration pneumonia or other complications related to dysphagia? You recommend a video fluoroscopy, but can't do it until Monday. What do you do in the meantime? In a case like this, I might consider recommending NPO with short-term alternate means of nutrition through a DOP-OFF tube if possible, given this patient's high risk for aspiration pneumonia. Even though the patient coughed with thin liquids and there was only one throat clear with thickened liquids and puree, I know that this doesn't mean the patient is safer with these consistencies. For that reason, I won't recommend thickened liquids at bedside. Consider that this patient has quite a few factors that increase her risk of aspiration pneumonia. She's critically ill, bed bound, dependent for care, and presumably has dysphagia. You can encourage ice chips and or small single sips of water after oral care with the nurse to reduce further swallow atrophy and improve oral comfort or hydration. If the patient's goals of care are aligned with pursuing a complete dysphagia intervention, then recommending NPO except ice chips and sips of water until the video fluoroscopy would be the path I would take. If the patient has already signed advanced directives that indicated absolutely no feeding tubes or no intervention, then this would lead to a team and family discussion of comfort measures based on the patient's wishes. Looking for a handout and downloadable resource that covers all of this information? Look no more. I'm going to give you one of our free MedSLP Collective resources. This resource is titled Thickening Without Instrumentation, an Evidence-Based Practice Review. Simply click the link into the description to download this resource now. And if you'd like even more education and judgment-free support on this hot topic, you can always join our community of over 6,000 medical SLPs and over 30 mentors inside the MedSLP Collective. Go to www.medslpcollective.com to learn more now.